Good morning. Uh, first of all, thanks so much to Steve Holden for inviting me to speak today at DjangoCon. Um, this talk is largely a rant <laughs> that I came up with from a recent experience trying to teach some basic programming uh, to some folks, and then all the reading that I did afterward, and then the Django app that I wrote over a weekend, <laughs> which gave me a new appreciation for the Django as an efficient rant to code translator <laughs> experience. <laughs> um, I also made a page of resources for this talk. Uh, I'll be quoting some facts and figures, uh, and this pirate pad has links to all the documents that I'm gonna talk about. And for those of you who are from countries other than Ireland, Great Britain, the United States, Germany, or Turkey, uh, if you know where to get a copy of the computer science curriculum from your country, the standards basically for K through 12, I'd love it if you would add a link. I already, I saw Enrique running around here and he has offered to add the link for Brazil. This information is actually fairly difficult to come by, uh, particularly for non uh, English speaking countries, so I'd really appreciate it if you could do that. Uh, the link's at the top of the page there. And finally, um, normally I give a lot of technical talks with a lot of bullet points and, you know, talking about Postgres and stuff like that, but this is more of a speech. And so uh, some of the slides are going to be blank. <laughs> um, and that's a feature, not a bug. So don't, don't be surprised when that happens. Uh, so, first of all, I'm from Portland, Oregon, and uh, for the past few years, I've been giving talks about mistakes, and uh, yeah, I see there's some people from Portland here, yay. Um, and uh, this is a slide from a talk I gave about some problems that I had keeping chickens alive. This is a map of my <laughs> reign of terror over my chickens. Um, and then <laughs> next I give some talks about system administration failures, like what happens when a new sysadmin runs a Unix find command to clean things up and then deletes all these zero length files in the file system, including the devices in the system. Uh, or how to take down a data center with four network cables and spanning tree turned off. Or how expecting reasonable or consistent IO performance in the cloud is just a bitter joke for the SQL DBAs that I know, and myself. And more recently, I've talked about hiring, how difficult it is to find the right people for tech industry jobs, how once you hire them, they probably are gonna find another great job way too quickly, and how the tech industry's demand for skilled developers, and especially for developers with open source skills, is growing faster than our ability to train them. And computer science enrollment at our universities has decreased by about 3% since 2005 in the US. That's from 11% down to 7% overall. And earlier in 2002, from 2002 to 2005, advanced placement computer science test takers decreased by 19%. And at the same time, the projected demand for computer science and computer-related jobs will increase more than 50% by 2018 creating about 1.5 million jobs here in the US. And researchers say that even in the places where enrollment in CS is up, companies report that they can't get the graduates who have any of the fundamental skills that are necessary for these new jobs. And these companies aren't just in Silicon Valley, in Oregon where I'm from, New York, LA, and even here in DC, finding developers who have the right skills is really hard. But I'm really actually not gonna talk too much about these things either. Today I'm gonna to share some observations about computer science education because I believe that our skill shortages start at the earliest stages in our schools and if the system is left as it is, open source will suffer the most. In a survey of 2,700 free and open source developers, 70% of those developers had at least a bachelor's degree and most of them discovered open source sometime between the ages of 18 and 22. This age and this time in college is the perfect time to connect with and attract people into what I call the open source lifestyle. And that lifestyle exists as a distinct culture on the internet, ideas about sharing, licensing, freedom, and a community of practice. And we're here not just to make friends and have a good time, but to work 
and learn and teach in these communities. And think about this. How much easier would recruitment be if every student that makes it into the university was already exposed to computer science ideas when they were in primary and secondary school? You may not know this, but my husband Scott is a high school teacher, and he specializes in global studies, journalism, and psychology. And recently he joined forces with a good friend of mine and Python Software Foundation member Michelle Rowley to help teach women how to program in Python. Naturally, I volunteered to help mentor in the classes that were offered. And this is a picture from one of those classes. Before these workshops, I'd actually never tried to teach someone how to program before. And for the workshops, I mentored groups of six or eight women over two days. Uh, Barbara, who's also here somewhere, um, was also a, a mentor. And we walked around the tables answering questions and just observing as some of the students learned about variables, conditionals, and functions for the very first time. I enjoyed getting to know this group of women who were really excited and looking forward to applying these skills that they were about to learn. And mentoring made me feel really great, but it was also a little shocking. Our first lessons explained file system navigation, the command line, and how to set up a GUI text editor. And some people quickly became lost and confused. The connection between a graphical file system browser and the command line was really difficult. Most of the students had never opened up a terminal and then beyond that typed a command into a terminal before. But that's not all that was, but that, that fact there is not all that surprising. What did surprise me was that some had never actually looked at the files through a graphical file browser before, instead using menus to find recently used files or saving everything into just one folder or just using a web-based file management tool like Google Docs. And for these women, I found myself at a loss. I sat thinking during a break about how exactly I could explain the concept of file systems to someone who had never been exposed to the idea before and needed to apply it both to the GUI and the command line at the same time. I thought really hard about real world examples that would help me explain. My hope is that you're all now thinking about the metaphors that you would try to use, the pictures you would draw, and what you'd say to a person who didn't understand file systems. Or maybe now that I've said that, you're thinking about it now. And maybe you're thinking about a person in your life who you might teach this lesson to, a parent, a brother or sister, a niece, or your daughter or son. I hope that you're thinking because I wanna ask each of you to do something after this talk is done. I want you to sit down with an important person in your life who doesn't understand computer science concepts like file systems and teach them. My guess is with the right lesson, you can teach this to someone in under an hour. And if we don't have the right lesson now, if we all tried this out, we'd end up with the best lesson in the world for teaching a person what file systems are using real world examples and the feedback from our loved ones about what worked and what didn't. And there's a really important reason why I want you to do this. I want us to demonstrate that sharing lessons works. UNESCO recently made the Paris Declaration, and in it they said they wanted to encourage the open licensing of educational materials produced with public funds. Recently, I contacted an organization to ask them if I could transcribe a few lessons that they'd shared in a PDF for free in text form, you know, take it out of the PDF, put it into some text, and then share that in a Git repo. My idea was to share these lessons and people allow people to submit the changes and observations as diffs. The organization that published the lessons told me that they couldn't allow me to use the lessons in this way because the research was government funded. Right. <laughs> it's bullshit. Okay. Um, <laughs> I believe that we can demonstrate to teachers and organizations that creating curriculum this way, by sharing it, um, we can demonstrate, them how useful, demonstrate to them how useful it is to share so that nobody gives me this kind of an excuse ever again. And I really wanna show teachers how interesting and engaging it is to let people take a lesson, try it out, and report back. These, after all, are the same skills that we need, that we use every day working on open source software except we'll apply this to teaching a lesson. So, get ready, I am going to ask you all to try to teach. I started understanding what programming was my second year of college. I'd spent almost a year doing tech support at my university, getting the job after some friends taught me how to install Linux from floppies and enough Unix commands to be dangerous. And one day, a friend sat me down and tried to teach me Pascal from a book. 
That experience left me a little frustrated and uh, pretty angry. I remember thinking that very little of what I was being taught, what was in this book, made any sense, and I felt really stupid. I decided at that moment that I never wanted to learn programming. Later, a different friend in college, Ishvan Marco, sat me down in front of a command line prompt and showed me a shell script. He told me about his work automating configurations and showed me how to set up a Linux system way more quickly than I could by typing every single command uh, one at a time. And the automation just totally blew my mind. What he modeled for me in shell scripting immediately made my work life better because I already had a job doing this stuff. And the tools he showed me applied to what I already knew about computers and installing new Linux systems, and I saw immediately how I could use it all. The whole world opened up as I thought through problem after problem, wrote little scripts to recompile kernels, and copied tricks from other friends, like timing commands, redirecting output from standard error to standard out. And in the beginning, I was just copying and studying because I was so afraid of making mistakes. The automation just seemed that powerful. It was really gonna mess something up. But soon I was remixing and writing my own stuff from scratch, and I was totally hooked. The next year I switched my degree program from chemistry to computer science. So I don't think every person exposed to shell scripting is going to want to become a programmer, but there's two things that happened for me in that lesson. What each one managed to get right was teaching me in my zone of proximal development, or the ZPD, it's an educational term that basically means it was just challenging enough to be interesting, but not so hard that I was completely frustrated. And this zone is where people learn things really well. The other important thing that happened was that the skill that my friend taught me was something that I could immediately apply elsewhere. But first he worked with me, what we call guided practice, to rewrite a simple shell script with my username as a variable. Then I went off on my own, writing my own scripts to start and stop network interfaces and automatically connect to servers and run commands. This is what we call independent practice. And later when I started writing Perl, I wrote my Perl exactly like I was writing bash scripts. I had just generalized my skills to another language and maybe in the worst way possible. But what all these things were, the modeling, the guided practice, the independent practice, and the generalizations, was how I really learned a new skill. I learned how to think about tasks with automation in mind, with parameters and variables in mind, and I really learned it well because my friend took time to be sure that I learned it. And my experience of having a real world application for a new skill matches up with the research about keeping women and minorities and many men engaged in computer science. The process of customizing curriculum for the life experience of the students is called contextualization. And of course, each person's context is different. Part of the challenge for educators is designing courses that can be relevant to the students from a variety of backgrounds, perhaps very different from the teacher, like teaching a bubble sort of student names in the physical world by having the kids line up and then move around, or using election data for local elections that affect students' lives to teach about database schema and report design. Or when you're thinking about this lesson, this file systems lesson that you're going to teach, finding a way to tie it to the life of the person that you're teaching. Have they ever lost a file that you later help them find with file system search? Have they ever lost a hard drive or part of a directory or lost something in the cloud? Have they created files in their computer? Do they know where those files actually are or what where means on a computer? Could you maybe draw some kind of structure to help them think about how the files are organized? Some people believe that the reason why we don't have enough people with the right kinds of developer skills is because university computer science programs aren't teaching the right things. And honestly, a lot of developers never went to college for computer science. And for all of us at JangoCon who are often trying to hire people with the open source skills, open source specific skills, it's certainly true that very few universities are training students for that. But I think there's a much bigger problem than the university programs out there. If you look at CS curriculum versus math, science, history, or literature, you'll find that there's almost no computer science taught in primary and secondary schools. In the US, over the past 10 years, we've lost 35% of the computer science classes taught in high schools. In addition, we have very few computer science teachers and inconsistent standards for testing and qualifying those teachers, leading to a teacher shortage in the places where computer science is actually wanted by a school. We're in DC this week, and so I'm reflecting on what we could be doing as a country to reverse this disturbing trend. And there's no simple solution, 
The policy recommendations require work and time and commitment to reforming the school system that most of the children in the United States will experience. And beyond that, if we want open source and Python and even Django itself to be part of the national conversation about computer science, we have to speak up now when the laws governing what's taught in our schools are being rewritten. And the research into what's happening and how to fix it is surprisingly detailed in both the diagnosis of what's wrong and the prescription to fix it. First, we have Running on Empty, which is a 76-page report that compiles the state of computer science curriculum in all 50 states. And the most fundamental observation that that paper makes is that there's a deep and widespread confusion within the states as to what should constitute and how to differentiate technology education, literacy, and fluency, information technology education, and computer science as an academic subject. And another observation that they make in that document is that in 2008, 17% of the AP computer science test takers were women, uh, even though women represent 55% of all AP test takers. And even more shockingly, I thought, 784 African American students nationwide in all of the United States. I don't know how many people live in the United States. It's a few million, right? 200 million, whatever. Only 700, 784 of them were Amer African American. So this lack of access to upper level computer science courses for underrepresented populations is creating a major equity issue for access to this critical knowledge. This is how people, this is where these jobs, where so many jobs are going to be in the future. 50% of STEM education jobs are gonna be in the future. It's, it's, uh, it's problematic. So um, the other thing that I wanna talk about is that there's a destructive assumption woven through the fabric of a lot of our communities, a belief that most people are just not cut out to be programmers. This belief is incredibly powerful and exists in the margins of how we talk about experience, rock star coders, and how people choose which classes that they take and ultimately their careers. And worst of all, this attitude is manifesting in damaging, discouraging stereotypes that ultimately limit the potential of all of these students. Stuck in the Shallow End is the second book co-authored by Jane Margolis about inequality and computer science education. And like the authors of the book, she recognized that swimming is a sport with mostly white athletes. But what's shocking is that African-American children are three times more likely than white children to drown. As their research unfolded, an unfortunate parallel emerged between the stereotypes and assumptions and denial of access historically present for swimming. And those, those same things also exist for students who might have taken computer science classes. Students were interviewed and they stated that the people most suited for taking computer science classes were white or Asian or male. And students and teachers described the ideal computer science students as extremely bright, the implication being that there's innate talent for work with computers rather than a set of skills that can be learned and accessible and relevant to everyone. And principals, pressured by No Child Left Behind's blind attention to test scores, see computer science as an elective the same way that home economics or floristry is an elective, making computer science an easy target for cuts even when there's significant student demand for these classes. And this is a breakdown of how states classify computer science. For the most part, it's an elective. And with No Child Left Behind, which is actually right now in the process of being uh, reformed, changes are in the process of being made, um, anything that's an elective, essentially, they're often just cut. So the statements the principals made about their students not just being interested in computer science reminded me of comment thread after comment thread I've read about the lack of diversity in startups and software development companies. The Python and Django communities have invested significant time and effort into changing both the rhetoric and the practice of encouraging diversity in our adult communities. Awareness and sympathy for the experience of minorities, whether toward racial, gender, economic, Neurodiverse, neurodiverse or some other minority has blossomed and created a truly useful and welcoming subculture, um, many subcultures really, in the few years that I've been watching. And we're going even further. We're investing in teaching absolute beginners how to program and how to get involved in our open source communities. We've got Hacker School, RailsBridge, Girl Develop It, the Python Women's Workshops, and there's just so many more. This movement of educating people, adults, is just amazing and flourishing. There's just so much going on in this space to help adults enter into our world and particularly the open source world. But now I believe that we need to turn our attention to schools. 
I talked with Inga Herber, who's one of the core organizing volunteers at FrostCon, which is a German open source conference a couple weeks ago. And she's preparing to teach secondary school computer science in Germany. And her observations were that there's a strong movement in the schools to get more computer science classes, yet there's still not many qualified teachers. But worse than the lack of access, uh, lack of classes and teachers, if you look at what's being taught in the few places where something like CS is available, we see classes like basic keyboarding, which drills you to type faster, um, are given the computer science label. Also, there's classes that teach you how to use Excel or Word, searching on the internet, or how to program in, in obscure or outdated languages, which actually for the students typically means copying and then pasting <laughs> into somewhere else, teaching you know, this wonderful copy pasta kind of programming in our schools. The most promising classes in high school would seem to be those that teach students how to take apart and put computers back together. Knowing the parts of the computer is certainly useful, but learning computer science by taking apart and putting computers back together is like learning to read by tearing books apart and putting them back together. In the same way that we don't think of book binding as essential for literacy, taking apart and putting back together computers, while it's fun and educational, it's not teaching computer science. What we really need to teach students has nothing to do with keyboards, the office suite, or motherboards. In the words of the Exploring Computer Science curriculum, we need to teach computational thinking practices of algorithmic development, problem solving, and programming within the context of problems that are relevant to the students' lives. And the idea of computational thinking comes from Jeanette Wing, who wrote about this idea for the ACM in 2006. She said, computational thinking is a fundamental skill for everyone, not just for computer scientists. To reading, writing, and arithmetic, we should add computational thinking to every child's analytic ability, just as the printing press facilitated the spread of the three R's. What is appropriately incestuous about this vision is that computing and computers facilitate the spread of computational thinking. It's kind of small, I guess, but uh, she provides a much larger definition later and includes this, which is my favorite part. It's a way that humans, not computers, think. Computational thinking is a way humans solve problems. It is not trying to get humans to think like computers. Computers are dull and boring. Humans are clever and imaginative. And we humans make computers exciting. Equipped with computing devices, we use our cleverness to tackle problems that we would not dare take on before the age of computing and build systems with functionality limited only by our imaginations. Jeanette Wing's description makes me think about a world where computer science would be inspiring to everyone, and not just inspiring, but also creative and fun. It makes me think of these great Ada Lovelace comics that I've seen, like this one by Sidney Padua, where Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace, the creators of the first computing machine, are crime fighters. The heroes are quirky, smart, and solving really tricky problems. Um, and another show that I really love is Sherlock. It's a BBC TV show for how wonderfully, and, and I love it because of how wonderfully geeky he is, and how he often uses silly pranks with technology to show off. And the first episode was him sending group texts as a sarcastic counterpoint to the police chief's press conference. And in the same way that Einstein and Feynman are crucial parts of the storytelling around physics, we need to talk more about the heroes of computer science and what made them human and interesting and not like computers at all. And armed with these fascinating stories, we can share them as part of our teaching because this is all really fun. I mean, this conference, it's full of people with great stories from their work, their open source involvement. There have been great times and near disasters and triumphs. And these can be our examples and starting points for explaining the computer science that we want our friends and our family to understand. As I've done my research, it's become painfully clear how separated open source developers are from teachers. There's a lot of reasons why this might be. I mean, I'm aware of it largely because I married a teacher, but I don't think that advocating for marriage between teachers and open source people is a scalable solution. <laughs> so other than marriage, how do we invite more people into open source? One barrier to communicating with teachers is being able to speak the language of education. This is not just the terms that teachers use for their work. It's also having the experience of and relating to teaching. Teaching is incredibly difficult. It's both mentally and physically challenging. When I finished mentoring students for one day and teaching a single hour-long lesson, I was ready for a beer and some sleep. And I just, I have a hard time imagining doing that every day. 
But teachers, they do this for eight hours a day every day. A valuable experience for every developer is to just for a few minutes teach something new to a person without a computer. See if you can get them, whoever you're teaching, you know, you schedule an hour with a friend or a colleague, see if you can get them to really understand and then demonstrate what you just tried to teach back to you. Like with the file systems, after you explain, see if they can do something specific, like find a special file, plant an Easter egg for them, or explain back to you what it is that you taught them, or even better, watch them try to teach someone else. And once you've had the experience of helping someone master a brand new skill, you've started down the path that teachers walk every day. This is a shared experience and a point of empathy you can draw on if you ever get a chance to talk directly to a teacher about these issues. For too long, open source advocates have focused on getting open source software into classrooms without understanding exactly what that means to teachers. When something goes wrong with my servers or my laptop, my job is to figure out what's wrong and to fix it. I have time in my day for mistakes and for bugs. Teachers, on the other hand, they have a certain number of hours in an entire year with the students. They count them, and that time is carefully scripted because teachers, <clears throat> I'm sorry, but teaching is actually very difficult. Teachers can't improvise excellent teaching when the computers they're using crash, or the software doesn't work the way they expected, or the user interface changes suddenly after an upgrade. All the things that I think of as features for teachers are another thing that takes away time that they would spend creating lessons and teaching students. And this is why I think that open source software isn't more widely used in schools. Because we've focused on getting open source into the school rather than solving problems for teachers. And I don't mean to diminish the efforts of the many amazing projects that are out there, like School Linux, a school-specific Linux distribution based on Debian. And there's lots of other examples of amazing software that's been developed for schools. But if we look at the software that runs grading and attendance, the software that the kids use to play games, and the operating systems on teachers' computers, that software is still largely proprietary. And I hope that I can, just through this, plant a seed of empathy in you for what these teachers are up against. Think about how much time you spend considering a simple lesson, like about these file systems that you're going to teach. My husband, he is given one hour a day to plan for seven hours of teaching. I spent about 100 hours <laughs> preparing for this 45-minute keynote. The ratio of preparation time to instruction time is terrifyingly small for professional teachers. If open source contributors all experience what in-person teaching is like with non-technical people in our lives, learning to use modeling, guided practice, independent practice, and generalization in our own lessons about open source technology, we'll develop a common vocabulary to talk to teachers. In the same way that in free and open source software, we share a vocabulary that starts with freedom, source code, and sharing. And once we can talk with these teachers, we can do so on a regular basis. And we can ask them what it is that they really need and how we as open source experts can help make schools and teaching even better. Because really, teachers and the open source software movement are natural allies in our efforts to share information. We have a tremendous problem ahead of us. And there aren't enough people who understand the fundamentals of computer science. There's a lot at stake. And we're in an era, era where privacy, financial security, and our elections are managed by software. If we get this right, then the software we create will also be used to fight corruption, solve important problems, and make us all more free. But before I leave, I want to share a story from 2009. It's not an open source story yet, but it's the story about the power of computational thinking when applied to a democratic process. In 2009, I was invited to come teach a class about PostgreSQL. I traveled to Ondo State, Nigeria, specifically to Akora, right there. And here's a picture of my students. They all had degrees in computer science or had taken some programming classes, and most were software professionals uh, currently, or at that time. And it was from them that I learned how the governor of Ondo State, Oli Shagan Mimiko, won his election. He was running against a People's Democratic Party candidate um, the incumbent, who is also part of the majority party across Nigeria. You may not have heard about this, but in 2007, when the elections were held, there was countrywide unrest. The United Nations observers reported violence, and there were a lot of accusations of vote fraud. So when the ballots were counted, Mimico lost. But his campaign had been so sure that they were going to win because of the poll results. 
So they filed a lawsuit and got a hold of the ballot boxes for a recount. And it was at this point that they decided to do something different. The IT staff was an integral part of Mimico's political team, and they had an idea. The way that you vote in Nigeria is with a thumbprint next to a candidate that you select on a paper ballot. So if there was fraud, the Mimico team reasoned, you would have lots of ballots with the same thumbprint. The whole team hatched a plan. They would electronically scan in all of the ballots and then have someone, some expert somewhere, validate the fingerprints and find the duplicates. They searched the world for a fingerprint expert and they found Adrian Forty in Great Britain who has since passed on. Adrian Forty and his team analyzed all the ballots and they found a few duplicates. In fact, they found 84,814 duplicate fingerprints and in one case a single fingerprint was used 300 times. So after a two-year court battle, they finally won. But their work was just beginning. One of the places my colleagues took me was Idan Ray Hill, which is on the tentative World Heritage Site list. This is a picture of a handrail that was cut by the outgoing government. My colleagues, colleagues said that this statement in Yoruba, which I won't try to pronounce for you, means they left like thieves. Mimico had won the election, but they got no help from the outgoing government in the transition to power. But of course, this method of detecting voter fraud went viral. The expertise in counting fingerprints has been shared with neighboring states, and similar fraud was uncovered and stopped in Osun State as well. And there's been, I think, two other, two other states that have used this method. And in this way, the people with what many of us in this room would consider very basic computer science and literacy skills, pattern detection and matching, use of a scanner, and some searching on the internet to find an expert, were used to overturn a fraudulent election. This kind of education and empowerment to use computers to solve difficult problems is exactly what we should be teaching all of our children to go out and do. And the new government in Ondo State has been very focused on IT initiatives. This is some cell tower that was being built and I thought it was crazy these guys up there doing this. Um, but also kind of awesome. And in, in particular, they've been really focused on uh, cell phones to connect citizens with their government. One initiative gave all new mothers cell phones to stay in touch with their doctors. Uh, the program resulted in reducing the number of mother and, child's, mother and child deaths to just one last year, which was a 35% drop in infant and, uh, mother and infant mortality. And their goal is a 75% reduction in infant mortality by 2015. This last picture is taken of two friends uh, as we were hiking up at Ray Hill. And uh, this is what I'm going to close with. Um, we need to teach people how to ask the right questions, to be suspicious or satisfied of the answers that they get to those questions. We need to help to teach people how to break apart problems into understandable chunks instead of assuming that they will never understand something that's complicated. And we need to teach them the value of sharing source code, what it means to have software freedom, and how much it matters to us that everyone has the opportunity to learn from and build upon the work of others. And I believe that we can demonstrate again to the world how useful it can be to share, how interesting and engaging it is to let people take a lesson, try it out, and report back. Please think about these file systems. Think about your friends and family and who you, spent, who you could spend an hour with teaching them an important skill that would help them understand our world of computers. And I encourage you to do this. I've done a couple of things. First, I did a little research. I practiced on my mother-in-law. And the best metaphor that I've come up with so far is comparing a file system to a city. The streets are your folders, and the addresses contain houses that are full of data. And here's a link to a bare bones PowerPoint that a graduate student made using this metaphor. <clears throat> Actually, there's, there's several other educational resources on this link. Um, <clears throat> and it includes some questions that you can answer, or you can ask your student, um, and an exercise for addressing and moving data around. And some of the questions that my student, my mother-in-law, asked me included, <clears throat> what happens when you delete files, and what is autosave really doing? Um, how is it that people recover data from failed disks? Which was a good question. And each one of these questions that she asked me was really interesting and took me a little time to explain. So I'd really love to hear what any of you come up with if you try to do this. And secondly, my rant app. I created 
is this little site. It's really bare bones. You can only log into it with Twitter right now, sorry. Um, but the idea is to link to some lesson that you found, or I have a list of things that I've added so far, uh, and publicly say that you're gonna try to teach someone how that, and then when you're done, to report back and how it went. So um, I actually have the code to make it so you could log in with email. So I'm probably going to hack on that this afternoon and make that work, but I hope that you'll have a look. Um, the code's up on GitHub, of course, and if you have any bugs, uh, if you find any bugs, definitely let me know. So thank you very much for your time today. Questions? Selena, if you think about the, the use of computers as a pyramid, then you can think of, of people with basic keyboard skills using copy and paste and word processing at the bottom of the pyramid. And wouldn't you agree that really computer science is not for the people who want to apply the technologies? Computer science is mostly for or, or primarily for the people who, want to, to, who need to develop the technologies. And that in fact there are three layers, computer science for the inventors, uh, the, the low-level skills for the users, and then in the middle is the band that we occupy, which is the band where we're actually applying technology rather than inventing the fundamentals. So I'm, I'm just worried about the term computer science, which has been misapplied so much. Yeah. And I, don't, I don't think that a lot of what we need to teach people... Programming isn't necessarily computer science, is, is my point. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I really like the term computational thinking yeah. because it, uh, instead of, like, I, I haven't really thought about the pyramid of, you know, the stacking of skills in exactly that way, but I think of computational thinking as analogous to reading, and there's a set of skills around that, like understanding what a loop is, you know, understanding uh, variables. I mean, there's a lot of metaphors that you can yeah, use. Yeah, maybe we can talk later about the, the initiatives that have been in the UK where they've also been thinking about yeah, I would education. Yeah, I would love to hear about that. Thank you. Okay, uh, my question is, is essentially about the, the chicken and egg problem that exists here. That um, I completely agree with what you're saying, that we, we need better, exp like uh, computer science or computer computational thinking is not some esoteric um, elective, it should actually be part of it. It's like reading, writing, and arithmetic, understanding how the world works in the future, you're going to need to have this knowledge. Right. But getting from here to there is a really big step. We're dealing with a society that thinks that computer geeks are all weird guys, weird fat guys with glasses in dark rooms, not women and African Americans, and, and you know, there's a, there's a broad, there should be, everyone needs this, it's not just the smart Asian kids. And we've got teachers who are in schools who at the moment, like from my experience when I was teaching at university level, the worst students were the ones who had been taught at high school because they'd been taught so very badly by people who didn't have the skills. Yeah. Um, how do we get from here to there? How, how do we change both society's expectations or society's understanding of what computing is and get the levels of, 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 of teacher education so that they are teaching useful skills, not just the typing and the, and the bad copy and paste programming? And what's the next, what's the first step? Or how do we, how do we, how do we get out there? Well, I have an answer. Right. <laughs> Let's see. I don't know if I can work this crazy thing. Well, anyway, I, I, so on the very first slide um, that I showed a link to this pirate pad, um, so there's actually been some curriculum produced. The last two years have been kind of amazing as far as people in the U.S. being aware of this problem and actually working to solve it. Uh, and so this curriculum that was developed, it's geared toward 10th and 11th graders, which is a great, great age. Uh, and it's all about this idea of computational thinking and getting kids comfortable with creating algorithms and understanding what algorithms are. Uh, and the curriculum was designed for teaching in inner city Los Angeles schools. And currently it's being piloted. So the, they released the book for free, it's a PDF that anyone can download, and I've been giving it to all of the people that I know that are teaching hacker schools and doing stuff like that. Um, so to me, like that first step is creating this curriculum. And then once you have some curriculum to work from, that people, you know, I, I've read through it and I think it's pretty good. So whatever, for whatever my opinion's worth in that. But uh, taking that and trying to teach it, 
You know, that, I mean, that's the most critical thing with anything involving teaching is actually going out and teaching the curriculum as opposed to writing it. Because it doesn't matter how much curriculum someone writes. If nobody's teaching it, it's not useful. Uh, so that to me is kind of the building block piece. That's the first step. Uh, politically, in the United States, we have a pretty complicated problem to solve. And uh, there's an organization called the Computer Science Teachers Association that's affiliated with the ACM. And they've actually produced a policy document. And there's a bill, actually, that's been sitting in Congress for the last year that's co-authored by one of the senators from Oregon. And uh, that bill needs to be passed. Uh, we need to get computer science into our STEM education bills mentioned specifically because right now it's just it's considered an elective yeah. and it really should be considered uh, a core a core thing either applied to math or science so I think there's the we got to teach and have curriculum so that there's something there for the kids and then there's these political solutions at the highest levels that have to be implemented I had this will be the last question. Uh, at my previous job and at my current job, I think I'm the only one there with a, a bachelor's degree, and I, I feel like I work with a lot brighter developers than I am. Do you think a bachelor's degree is worth what it used to be, and is it even needed in the computer, computer science world right now? Uh, I'm not sure that it's necessary for computer science, to be honest, particularly the way that computer science is taught today. Um, I wish that it was better, right? I do pretty strongly believe in the idea of a liberal education, not politically liberal, but like the classical definition of a liberal education where you learn a lot of different things um, across a lot of different disciplines. So I think that there's a lot of value in a university education because of the ideas that you get exposed to. But yeah, I'm not, I think the jury's still out on whether CS degrees are really worth it. I think there really needs to be an overhaul in the curriculum. And I personally, you know, want there to be a lot more focus on open source and the development practices that come when you work in open source communities. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I'm Thank you. And I, I would love to talk with anybody about this stuff, so please just come come and find me.